Welcome to Hourglass Cinema, a variety show from victims and villains, a nonprofit which creates content to educate and engage individuals on mental health awareness and suicide prevention through pop culture. I'm your host, Captain Nostalgia, and I am joined by fellow writer Alan Cram. Hey, good to be here. And we're going to be talking about Creature Feature Weekend. This is one of many podcasts, videos, and just things that you're going to see coming out the month of September from this year's uh, festivities. Uh, we had a really good time this year. I mean, this was a lot better than, uh, not that saying that 2019 wasn't, uh, a, was a bad time or anything, but this was, uh, this was an amazing convention. Yeah, and I think we got way more content than you're used to out of oh, this convention. 100%. Because you're not used to me taking my uh, expensive camera and video gear along and getting video interviews and like the YouTube page is going to blow up here in the next few weeks. So, <laughs> so if you sure. haven't already go, go ahead, go over and subscribe to our YouTube page. Yeah. Um, if you guys also, if you guys haven't checked out, uh, Alan's project, uh, podcast, uh, it's called, you have to watch this podcast. Uh, tell us a little bit about the show real quick. Uh, every week on our show, we have one of a, one of our hosts watch a movie they haven't seen for the first time. So we go through and pick each one of us picks every week that a film that one of us hasn't seen uh, recently. Uh, I think coming up, I'm having my co-host Devin watch dirty dancing for the first time because he doesn't understand what dirty dancing is about. I'm pretty sure he thinks it's about strippers, but it's not. <laughs> no, that's um, footloose. No, that's not footloose. That's uh, that's flash dance. Sorry. Yeah. Aaron strip tees. Like there's, there's several about strippers. Showgirls. Yeah, there's several. He he doesn't know what Dirty Dancing is, though. So Maybe I'll come on and I'll, I'll have you guys watch Showgirls. You know, that might actually have to happen because <laughs> you're the true. biggest fan of Showgirls I know. Which I, I don't I don't know how to, I feel about that as a uh, compliment. Let me rephrase that. You're the only fan of Showgirls I okay. know. Okay. Let me turn off my air here. Sorry about that. That is uh, it's perfectly fine. I... I don't know what it is about that movie. It's so bad, but it's also like I've just did a deep dive. It was one of the deep dives I did in COVID times that went way too far. Yeah. But yeah, that's what we do. We, we stream live on Twitch every week. Uh, so you can follow us over there on Twitch. We have a YouTube channel and we're available on all major podca podcasting pa platforms. Yeah, so this, so I guess we should also specify that this is the first time that either one of us have done a convention together yes uh which was interesting so because for those of you guys that have met us um, met myself on the convention circuit or have been to us while we're tabling or doing press typically it's my wife and i and last time we did creature feature i did it by myself and mostly is that is because my wife doesn't like horror which is fine um you know want to respect everyone's mental health and uh, you're not really a horror guy, so I, I'm actually curious to hear your opinions on a horror con. I'm not a horror guy at all. Like, the, the conventions I've been to have been, like, pop comic cons. Like, I've done New York Comic Con a few times. I've done some smaller local, local cons. I've done toy fairs. I've never done a horror convention, but I... I enjoyed it. Like, it, it's, I wasn't into everything that I saw, but there was a lot there for me. And I enjoyed that. Uh, I enjoyed seeing a lot of the cosplays, meeting some great people, uh, some of who, who I have had already met and worked with before on uh, on some films or just like meeting at other cons. Um, but no, I enjoyed myself. Like It was fun. Um, we'll get into some of the things I didn't enjoy here in a bit. <laughs> yeah, so it, Creature Feature, for those of you guys that don't know, is a interesting... It's a really interesting uh, project that uh, the, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but uh, Craig and Sandy are the people that run it. And it is a horror con film festival hybrid. Yeah. And I feel like that's the reason why I love it because film festivals are some of my favorite things to cover on Victims and Villains. Uh, obviously, if you guys have been following us for any amount of time, we just got done with our Fantasia Fest coverage. Um, before that, we had, uh, we've earlier this year, we've done uh, the Berlin Final Girl Film Festival. 
Um, we did an unnamed film festival in March. We've, we've covered a lot of film festivals, but uh, I like that aspect because you get both the both worlds of film festivals and conventions. And for me, it's been... I don't know if I've ever done... A, I definitely haven't done a convention that has the film festival aspect to it as well. I can't remember the last time I went to a film festival. It's been so long. Um, but I really enjoyed the hybridness of that. Um, and like, I, I want to cover more uh, film festivals here in the future for victims. So... Whenever you need me, I, I will answer the call. You got it. Like like the 2016 Ghostbusters. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I feel like, you know, and we've kind of talked about the, uh, the with the promoters about uh, the possibility of like actually making this like a, a staple uh, con, con, uh, convention and film festival for it. So uh, every year it's typically either the last week in August. Um, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We'll provide links in the, the show notes where you guys can uh, hopefully check it out for next year. I have heard whispers of what they're planning for next year, and if you really liked this year, I can 100% your, it's going to knock your socks off next year. Well, you have to tell me after we, we're done recording. I Okay. So. I, I only know, like, whispers and, like, teases, so I don't know, like, exact details, but, yes, I can make that happen. Yeah. Um, but we're going to kind of get into it. Um, like Alan said, like a lot of the content that you guys are going to hear and see this month is going to be on, uh, YouTube, IGTV, and, uh, just kind of all over all of the socials, all of the socials. Make sure that you guys follow, uh, links once again are in the description below, but we're going to get into, uh, on this episode specifically, we're going to be looking into the, film festival aspect of it and kind of talking about uh, our thoughts on these indie films and some of them you guys will actually be able to check out in uh, for rent or uh, you guys can actually rent them and, and watch them for free on platforms. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure that you guys can, uh, if you guys are interested, we will provide links in the show notes and kind of tell you where to, where to check it out. Um, and I think anything that's not available, once it becomes available, we'll be resharing some stuff yeah. to social media. Because I, I know, like, at least one film is just about to get its release stuff from from a studio, which is the one that deserves it and yeah. so incredibly. We'll get to it in, in just a few minutes. Um, and then also in this episode, we did get the chance to sit down with some of the filmmakers. So you guys are also going to get to hear um, and then see visually if you guys want to. We'll provide that in the show notes as well, um, the video alternatives. Yeah. We almost had Ted Raimi. Almost had him. Yeah, yeah, Ted Ted did not happen. Yeah. Timing. We tried. We tried our best to get Ted Raimi for you guys, but scheduling-wise, it just did not work out. He wanted to meet us this morning. Uh, we were not planning on going to the con this morning, so we, it, it just didn't work out. So in, in true what up with that fashion, apologies to Ted Raimi. Um. Anyone who watches SNL in like the 2010s will get that reference. I know you don't. I don't. So I, I watch SNL and I don't get that reference. But let's let's jump into it's, it. It's an old older sketch. All right, so. let's let's jump into it. The first film that we are doing on the docket is Spirit Animal, which you guys can actually hear uh, an interview in just a few minutes. Basically, this movie tells the story of a kid that grows up and basically serves a tree god and embodies the talents of multiple different animals as a serial killer to make sacrifices for the tree god that's a, that's i feel like the best like non spoiler version of it yeah for the story wise what, what What's interesting about this movie is, and I'm going to get into a lot of technical stuff with these films, because uh, the story, like I, the story stuff, is more your your area of expertise when it comes to horror stories and how the tropes work and all of that. Uh, what what intrigued me about this one, which I didn't realize until we were going into the theater, was it was presented in Smellovision. Which I have never seen. I've never had to go into a movie with a scratch and sniff card before. You're welcome. Um, 
I, I wouldn't thank me too. I wouldn't. I'm not thanking you for that um, because some of those <laughs> some of those smells some of those smells were not were not necessary. <laughs> like I did not need to see. Sm- I did not need to smell some of the things that I smelled, and I had to wash my hands afterwards from holding the card the whole time. I also will uh, say uh, that is a spoiler. So we're we're not going to talk about which smells we had to smell. No, um, I mean some of the like the smells were very accurate for what you were getting. Yeah, but, but uh, almost they were almost too good. Um, but it was really interesting just having that aspect because I talked to the filmmaker after our interview because we forgot to ask about that, and I was like, "How did you go? How do you go about getting scratch and sniff cards?" And I guess it's a it's a whole process that and people like you can get them made locally and they made them for them and they, they cost a bit, but you can like go through and pick out what smells you want and. They told me what some of the official smells were that we got. And I'm like, that is horrifying. I don't know. I do not need to know that that existed as an option for scratch and sniff. Yeah, it's, it really enhances that kind of uh, filming experience. Like, I, I feel like out of every festival, at every film we watched for this festival, that was definitely kind of uh, the. I won't say the the best experience, but it was the most interactive experience because it, yes. it, it completely changes the dynamic of how you watch a movie when you can involve senses and or like something like three D is actually done correctly. And the the other thing that this film had going for it technically is the way they filmed it because it was filmed on VHS tape, so instead of going filming digital and then adding a filter in post which is probably the way I would have gone. Uh, they just filmed it all on VHS tape and then did post-production that way. Like, I think I'm, I'm assuming they did a digital transfer and had it all on, um, like in a standard editing suite videos, yeah. editing software. Um, but in camera, it was all on videotape, which at, which gave it a really interesting feel because it's presented as a, Hey, we found this VHS tape. Uh, check it out or don't. Like, like, the way it's presented is pre- is as a VHS tape. Let me just say that I love that introduction. So it it, it and it it's not just something that's like presented on a analog format, but it's something that like it feels like an authentic VHS tape because there's there's two commercial slash previews that you watch prior to actually getting into the movie. And third, you also have that introduction to the aspect of, oh, yeah, like this, there's a guy that's like a bartender that's basically just being like, you know, what are you drinking? And he kind of talks about how this movie is like they it presented almost kind of in like a Blair Witch-esque intro. And I, I kind of really enjoyed that. Like for me, like I thought that was genius that they just like really committed. And I feel like while... I know that we're going to, when getting into this, like, I think we kind of reached the same audience. I have to, I have to give them props and respect that they like had a vision and committed to said vision. Yeah, no, they, they definitely set out to do what they wanted to. It was not, not a film that I particularly enjoyed for myself. I will probably want to seek this out for my own viewing. But having seen it and knowing what their intentions were and like going for the trauma as like like tra- trauma um, perspective and style and like the DIY horror elements of it, I, I really appreciate what they did. Uh, and they were really nice people to talk to afterwards. Um, but the, the special effects are very... DIY, but in a in a fun and campy way. Yeah, it's it's really uh, I'm glad so glad you brought in the the trauma aspect of it because not only is this this movie is trauma, this movie is is campy. It, it's it, it never takes itself seriously, even from the way that you go back to to go back to that bartender commercial. Uh, even the way that the story is presented, it never once takes itself seriously, and I really liked that. Uh, but there was a there's a point in the movie where like even the gags of the individuals dying felt like really like over the top to me, and like there's there's a point that someone dies uh, via 
uh, a rectum insert by a stick and it goes through and it like that was just like and some of the smell of vision stuff too like that was just kind of like really excessive to me and like for me i for me personally i feel like that kind of format works in a smaller scale like if you're going to do something that's like 45 minutes i can get behind it but an hour and a half movie it just doesn't feel correct it just feels too excessive for me okay i mean yeah i i agree with you a bit there um but for what they were going for i can definitely i definitely appreciate the film a bit more than i did walking out of it yeah um in hindsight because they they definitely had a goal in mind and they they had a style they were going for and each kill gets more and more ridiculous and I can appreciate that. And the gore is cartoonish with the, the way they go about it. Like the blood doesn't look like blood. It yeah. looks more like, uh, like, um, it, it looks like chocolate syrup kind of like, it looks like chocolate syrup. Uh, some of the, the more red blood looks like a uh, gelato, mm-hmm from Rita's that you mix the custard in and like a red one and let the custard let it all melt. And then it's like a a pinkish type thing. Like it looks, it look, it it look, it's comical. And I enjoyed that. And I think that's what they were going for. The, the, the style of which they show everything and the way they, um, everything that you see, I think is intended to be seen the way it's seen. And, or smelled. And and, and I, I completely can get behind that 100%. My biggest, I feel like, problem with it was just the fact that there were some of them that over-the-top nature of, of those particular scenes just felt so excessive to me. And knowing that this is a, this is a trauma film, uh, inspiration film, and, you know, you're really trying to embrace a lot of that uh, like '90s culture, this felt like such a a niche thing. Because like I think we were talking about this after walking out of the theater yesterday is that we can respect them for what they were trying to do, but it necessarily we weren't necessarily the, the audience for it. And I feel like a lot of people that are potentially going to check this movie out are going to come away with the same thing. Like if you love kind of those like really cheesy like direct to video like uh movies from the 80s and the 90s and or like really love like toxic avenger and tromeo and juliet and a lot of the the other like just over the top uh you know john waters and uh you know lloyd kaufman kind of movies like this is definitely the movie for you this will definitely satisfy that but i feel like for an average viewer even an average average horror viewer this might not necessarily be your cup of tea. Yeah, and not, not being the average uh, horror viewer, I can say that for a lot of this stuff. Um, this one in particular is is a bit out in left field for me. Um, like I said, this isn't something I would probably seek out on my own. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about, technically, technical wise, like I, I appreciate, I I've grown to appreciate the VHS filming technique that they used because if it was if it was me i would have filmed digital and then done post conversion and done a filter because i've played with those before and that you get really good effects from that um what what bugged me a lot about the way they filmed this was the sound the sound felt like it was all in camera and for what you're going for that's fine but I feel like the film could have benefited from audio being outside of the videotape aspect, like uh, just an actual sound recording outside of the videotape oh, camcorder. Uh, yeah, and I, I can definitely understand that. Like you said, like I, I'm gonna be coming at this more from the uh, the you know the standard. So you're you're getting a, a complete review here. Yeah. Um, from from two different angles, whether it's the technical or the the more narrative acting wise, I feel yeah. like this movie was was really funny, mm-hmm. uh, and that's kind of something that I really enjoyed about the absurdity is that I didn't walk away feeling like 
gross about this movie or that like I wasted my time. Like it, it it's really it's a really fun film and it's also I've seen a lot of slashers and I really enjoy the inventiveness that they were able to bring here. I, I think the biggest disappointment for me with this movie though is the fact that this is the first this is the second film of the day that we had technical issues with in the theater because the film ended about five or ten minutes early uh, to the point where the director was trying to get the theater to play the rest of the film and something had happened with the projector. It, they didn't have the full film. It cut off for some reason, which was disappointing. I would have, Having talked to them about what the actual ending of the film was, I would have liked to see that. Um, and I feel like that would have helped our... Help my at least my uh, experience with it because it just it just ends and it, it it's a little bit well so like like and we're gonna the the interview we're gonna play in just a few minutes like is gonna kind of talk about this a little bit more but one of the things that I feel like this film does really well is that it's it's not like only like campy and like it's over the top but it, like it's it and I kind of missed this in my initial viewing but talking with Natty the director afterwards like. I kind of saw that what she was kind of going with for w- through the, the the spirit animal aspects that this is not only a film that is paying homage to to trauma and you know just those direct to video uh, era of horror in the eighties and nineties, but this is also uh, self conscious when it's coming to talk about things like pollution and also uh, for the mental health moment for this film in particular. I would pull from uh, the character Lisa, who is in a abusive relationship, and she also kind of has PTSD for it. And the director is going to expand upon that in this film, in the film, uh, kind of why they did that. Uh, but I feel like specifically for this one, I feel like they captured that really well. Yeah, I I, I definitely appreciate what they did with the mental health aspect, the environmental stuff didn't feel like there was a lot there like they they address it in spots but it wasn't there throughout the whole film whereas the the abusive relationship and the recovery from that feels present throughout the whole film the environmental stuff was kind of here and there um which i could i could have used a little bit more of that as well yeah so i'm gonna let her kind of speak on the the more mental health aspect um and uh but before we kind of played that interview, Rorschach rating scale time, zero to five, halves being allowed, where would this land for you? Um, I'd probably give this, uh, the, the, the smell of vision improves it a little bit for me. I'm going to give it a, a three and a half. Okay. I think. Maybe, yeah, I think I'm going to just go three. Okay. I, I'm going to go right there with you, and I'm going to give it a I'm at a little bit lower. I'm going to go at 2.5. I feel like I, I applaud their their uh, their techniques as far as, like, with with the analog approach to, to the storytelling, uh, just the inventiveness of the, the story. But uh, some of the, the aspects just kind of felt, like, overdone to me. And it's evident that it's made for a niche audience that I am not a part of. Yeah. Um, and so I think when, in the same way, like when you have like critics review, like kid movies, you always have those lower scores and that's because they're not the right intended audience for that. And that's how I kind of feel watching spirit animal. Okay. So we're going to play a interview right now that we did with, uh, the director and some of the cast and special effects, uh, crew, and uh, if you guys would like to see a video version of this, click the link in the descriptions below. We'll be right back. All right, what is up? We are here with uh, the filmmaker and subsequent cast and also special effects guru over here uh, of the independent movie Spirit Animal. I'm here with uh, writer-director Maddie. What's going on? How much? How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Great. Great. Got, I got actor Keith over here. Hello. And uh, also fellow actor slash, uh, like I said, special effects guy, Mr. Joe. Photographer. Hey. <laughs> All right. So let's just let's just cut right to it. Yeah. Uh, for those of you guys that are at home that might not know this, tell us a little bit about what the movie is about. 
So the movie follows this group of uh, kids who don't respect the environment or anything, and they rent a cabin for New Year's, and then the killer stalks them, and he uses different animal masks to kill each one of them, and the way he kills them kind of has to do with what animal he is. Like, when he's a whale, he's a harpoon, has a harpoon. When he's a shark, he kills with a straw. So it's that type of stuff, and he's killing people because he thinks when they... When he kills them, they'll come back to life as an animal. Environmental. <laughs> Extreme. <laughs> so let's, let's, talk about the, uh, let's talk about the feel and the tone of this movie. Uh, this movie is Trauma AF. Oh, let's, yeah. just, let's just put that out there. Uh, I, I love it, too, and, and we got some love for Tommy Wiseau. Just going to throw that in there, too. Yeah, uh, the one line, yeah. We got a great reference to You're Tearing Me Apart, Lisa, so uh, had to fit that in there. And I think it's subtle enough where it's not standing out too much, but it always gets a laugh. I mean, if you know, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so let's, let's kind of talk about uh, you. So the, the, the killer goes through many different animals, okay. dog, orca, uh, cow, I mean, the giraffe like there's just such a long list yeah uh what particularly about these animals i you know i don't really even know i just started writing and it just kind of made sense like my one friend sarah she worked at this place called the dog stop and i was like well she's got to get killed by a dog and then you know the cow just that was something i wrote later we had already started shooting the movie and i added that in i was like it'd be funny if there was a meat cleaver you know cow and uh shark is my favorite animal so i had to put that in there buffalo was kind of inspired by south park when they're talking about spirit of the buffalo like everything just kind of yeah remember that they, they're <laughs> indians had a casino it was like spirit of the buffalo i don't know so it all just kind of came together and it just kind of made sense dingo pizza was something i came up with for a past movie and dingo made sense to put in there so all right so let's talk about special effects mr joe how did, how did you do it, man? Let's walk us through your process. Uh, well, we just basically went with what we had. I mean, and then the idea of the talking tree, like with, you know, we just made that out of cardboard, pretty much. Like the idea then of having Toby Radloff involved, uh, the killer nerd. Uh, that was something we came up with, I think, in post production when we were pretty much done filming the movie. And then somehow we came up with the concept of having a talking tree and egging on the killer to influence him to commit all of this. So just, we just kind of went with what we had. I mean, as you do when you're a DIY filmmaker. Yeah, like we just went in the kitchen and saw what was in there, what was sloppy, what was disgusting, and utilized it. A lot of food coloring, a lot of chocolate syrup. Yeah, whatever we had around. Fair. I mean, it works. It works. Definitely works for the yeah. film. Yeah. And then if something didn't work, I know we'd reshoot certain special effects scenes several times, and that's about the only thing that we do more than two or three takes for, the effects. Yeah, with the acting, that wasn't so much a case. Yeah, one I mean... take wonders. Hey, it works, though. Especially with this guy. <laughs> He's a ten-take wonder. <laughs> yeah, they make me do it about ten times over. And even even if I got time. it perfect, they'd make, it, they'd make me do it ten times over. And I was willing to do it, too. And I was willing to do it because I, I, I love I love I love them so I don't mind I don't mind putting on an act for them and everything they said they got a role for me I came through I started acting it was good and everything just started popping off and everything was great so I feel blessed in that in that right yeah so tell us a little bit about how you guys got involved with like the acting side of things uh, basically, I knew Maddie through Giant Eagle, so we worked at the same same place. And I would, I would, I I went around with a band for a little bit, so I was in the music game a little bit. And then uh, after that, uh, Maddie said, "Hey, I'm acting. I got some acting roles. Come on up. Let's see what we what we could put together." And that's where I met Joe and Jenny Lou and all those all those people and everything like that. And and for a few years, it was just like, uh, nothing, you know, Maddie had what she had, but she dropped that, and she picked something else up, and this is what she created, you know, and I'm appreciative for that, you know. I mean, you got some of the best moments in the movie. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, well, 
Ah, uh, Maddie, that's that's re seconds. yeah, that's yeah, that yeah, that's really me. That's really like Maddie <laughs> when she wrote this script, she said, "Hey, uh, I'm gonna write it just like the people that are really like how they are, how Joe is, how I am, how everybody it really is, and that's she hit it on point there." Yeah. So let's let's talk about what makes this movie unique. We talked about how it it's a love letter to to trauma, uh, but this movie. Talk about how it's shot. Well, we shot it on video. <laughs> Which is, I mean, yeah, like, there's, like, nostalgia for, like, VHS, and that's, like, starting to be, like, the next big thing with, like, vinyl coming back. But what inspired you to, like, want to shoot on video? So when I was younger, I was into, uh, you know, video violence and Cannibal Camp Out and all those old cam motion picture releases. Killer Nerd was, like... The first movie I saw where I was like, you don't need a lot of money to make a movie. This got distribution. This is awesome. My friends and I, we watched it. We were on the... Have you seen Killer Nerd? No. Oh, man. There's this horrible head explosion. And we wound it like five times laughing. And like, I was like, that just inspired me. So I've always loved shot on video. And I've always loved growing up. I rented videos. And I was like, I just wanted to have that look. There's a certain look to shot on video. 100%. Obviously. Yeah. And... Yeah, so many people were just like, oh, why don't you just use a filter later? Like, why? I, this is how I want it to look. So I, I just wanted to do it. And I also wanted to show people, like, you don't need the best cameras and everything. Like, you just need to have enough heart and passion, and you can make, you can make anything great, no matter if you're shooting with a cell phone, VHS camera, yeah, you know, 4K. But that's how, good, <laughs> yeah. that's how good Maddie and Joe are at that stuff. Like they went to film school together. They did all that stuff. So, I mean, that is the product of, mm -hmm. of that. And, and then they put together a masterpiece, and everything that they put out, I truly stand by. Aww. You know what I mean? <laughs> all right, so we're going to redirect the, the, the conversation to mental health uh, because that's, uh, that's the heartbeat of why we create the content we do. One of the characters has a, uh interesting journey throughout the course of the film uh not only do you guys speak on the uh kind of environmental pollution uh but you guys also speak on like the you know the danger of toxic relationships and i'm kind of wondering uh where'd that come from oh i don't even know i just you want to have someone to root against in the movie and i wanted her character to have like this type of journey where she was uh you know, one of the strong female character who, you know, came and conquered all of her fears and everything and just kicked ass at the end. And it just kind of made sense to put it in there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I've had friends who have had toxic relationships and everything and stay in them for whatever reasons. And I just wanted to touch upon that. I just wanted her to come out strong at the end, you know, let people know, you know, you're strong enough to battle anything, you know. That makes sense. No, no, 100%. One of the things that I specifically loved about watching the movie is that throughout the first act, like, she, there's two nightmare sequences that she has that you kind of, like, get to understand the gravity exactly. uh, of the relationship, and I'm so glad that you guys kind of, like, took her through that journey because it really inspires those that, you know, may have been in a toxic relationship, might currently be in a toxic relationship, might just even be, like, recovering from a toxic relationship that it's okay, it's going to get better. Like, exactly. it, you, your mental health might take a toll for a little bit, but with the right community and with the right resources, anything is possible. Oh. Agreed. Of course. And I would love... I try to have strong characters and everything I do. And yeah, you have the comedic ones and, you know, everything, but I always want that kind of strong characters. I appreciate that. All right. So this is the last question. Where can people find it? this online? Where can people find more information? Possibly pick it up? Because if you are a video nerd, hey... You can pick this up on VHS. Yes. Uh, so where can people find it online? Uh, you can uh, contact us at our Facebook page. Uh, just look up Spirit Animal Movie on Facebook. We don't have a web store right now, and we're hopeful for distribution in the future. But uh, Spirit Animal Movie on Facebook, or you can find me, Madeline Deering. I'm on Facebook, and message me and get a copy. Tight. Well, I thank you guys for all of your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And... Uh, Make sure that you guys click the links in the descriptions or wherever you guys are watching or currently listening to this to check out more about Spirit Animal and get in touch to see the movie. And uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, right, thank you. 
If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. You can also text HELP to 741-741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please, if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please, consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because... Once again, you have value and you have worth, so please stay with us. Welcome back, and uh, we're going to move on now to our next feature, which is Kill Giggles, and this tells the story of a damaged young man who turns to a life of serial killers to deal with his fear of clowns and all of his victims are specifically clowns we're also i got a chance to sit down with uh this director as well uh mr jason uh burton and yeah what'd you think about this movie it was definitely uh technically it was the best one that we saw uh from a, a technical aspect um this is the only film we saw on the second day that didn't have technical issues in the theater, which I think benefits it a little bit, but not as much as I'm going to make it sound like. Uh, I really enjoyed the performances in this film. Uh, there's a lot of comical ways of going about killing clowns. Uh, it's not just I'm going to um, stab them all to death. They're, he, they're very creative with how they, they deal with different clowns in different situations. Uh, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it. The main actor though, every time I saw him on screen, is like, is that Pete Holmes? Like it looked like Pete Holmes. He, he kind of sounded like Pete Holmes in spots. Um, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm glad it won the best picture of creature future weekend. Yeah. I, and I feel like also to your point, that's kind of unfair if you're going to downgrade on it. Cause the, the actor remind you of another actor? No, no, it, it's not downgrading. It's just like it was distracting. Okay, fair enough. Because because I'm such a fan of Pete Holmes, it was like I know it's not him, but it it it, it feels like him in spots, which is, which is a good thing. It was just distracting in my own mind. For me, coming off of Fantasia Fest, uh, like a couple days before this one, uh, some of the ones that I watched for Fantasia Fest were kind of like. Not the greatest, and also uh, watching some of the other features in this festival where I also felt the same, and this just felt like a, such a breath of fresh air. I think you're right. This is both from a, a technical standpoint and a narrative standpoint, acting, writing. This just kind of feels like the real deal, and this is the strongest film that Creature Feature Weekend had this year. I absolutely loved this. I feel like uh, Butterin, I'm probably going to mispronounce the, the gentleman's name. I, I want to say it's Buterin. Buterin, that, that's it. Um, so Buterin uh, does a really good job at delivering a compelling story that is equally therapeutic and also a love story. 
that I feel like it balances really well and it culminates in probably one of the most memorable climaxes slash endings I've seen in recent years with films. Yeah, the, the, the relationship aspect out is, is separate from separate enough from the killing of the clown stuff that it, it felt really believable where you can have that kind of relationship in other, the, the guy's a serial killer, but the, the girl doesn't know it stories and it doesn't really seem believable but here i actually buy that they're both into each other and like she is having an influence on him to like not want to do it and like i really enjoyed their chemistry um and then when he interacts with the clowns you also believe so much about his hatred of clowns like you buy that as well it it, Um, yeah it's a really well written well developed script and I feel like, to your point, like the the lead two actors, like definitely just have really great chemistry, which I feel like is hard to pull off in horror. Like it's it's really easy to to find the right people and say something like a drama or like a, a romantic comedy, but in horror, it feels incredibly hard to do because most of your leads are just here to die. So you're not really spending a whole lot of time. Whereas what you Buterin does here really well is that he develops a guy and a girl simultaneously and their relationship I feel like is the bedrock of this movie yeah it almost it almost plays like a romantic comedy where the guy is just a serial killer who kills clowns um and you can look at it like that like it, it, it you the argument could made, be made that it is a, a romantic comedy to a point because it has it hits all of those beats like the uh, meet cute and the relationship and the morning after like the first night and uh, it uh, it plays like a romantic comedy slash horror film. I uh, yeah, I one hundred percent agree. And it's it's funny because when you when you talk to Buterin, he's specifically talking about how he doesn't really feel like this film is a horror film, though I I would argue that it definitely has its moments. And there are moments that, like, it doesn't take itself too seriously. Like, probably one of my favorite moments is there's a, there's a three-way uh, montage scene that's kind of showing the relationship of the two main characters kind of developing and, and them falling in love. Uh, while also juxtaposed to him killing clowns and also at the same time having uh, the two detectives uh, run in, uh, kind of like try to like hunt him down. And I also think that uh, another film that really embraced this earlier this year was from uh, Grind Exploitation Film Festival, and it was, it was Bad Girls. They had running gags throughout the entire film uh, uh, specifically about the um, the detectives, and I just it was one of my favorite aspects of the story. And here they do the same thing. Like I don't know if you caught that, but there's like a running gag between them where like the older detective is kind of always making like circus puns, and someone's like always guessing what he's gonna say. And he's like, actually, I was gonna say this complete opposite thing. It was one of the smartest things that I really enjoyed about this film. Yeah, it, they they were. I, I like a good pun, and there were a lot of those when it came to that character in particular. Just with the circus stuff, like uh, I don't think he's happy to be here today. Uh, that kind of thing, uh, and some some of the kills get really creative. Uh, there's one involving uh, multiple uh, animals. That was my favorite one. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. Yeah. But that was probably my favorite. Um, but even like, I, I do want to talk about one in particular. So, slight spoilers. There, there's a moment where he beats a a mall clown with a sock of quarters, and I, um, what I liked about that is how he disposed of the weapon, which was he took the sock of quarters to the arcade and gave all of the quarters to the kids in the arcade. And threw away the sock. I was like, 
That is one of the most creative ways I've ever seen of disposing of a weapon. Oh, well, I 100% agree. And it it's also should be worth mentioning that, I mean, while we've talked about the um, the cast being just really well done and uh, really having solid um, performances in uh, Ellie Church and in Michael Ray Williams, this film also boasts a good deal of uh, horror royalty in uh, Felissa Rose, who uh, obviously is most known for Sleepaway Camp and... She will come back later in the podcast, I promise. Uh, Vernon Wells and uh, Judith O'Dare, and if you guys know who the last lady is, is that she was basically Barbara from Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, all people, I didn't really know who they were. <laughs> but when they say, and Judith O'Day as, yes. I was like, okay, she's important. Like she, She's someone that I just don't... Not knowing horror, I didn't know. But looking at IMDb, I can see a lot of things that she's done, and and I love how the film like doesn't like rely on their like status as like genre like pioneers to to like, but their background noise compared to everything else, mm -hmm. uh, compared to the other performances of Church and Williams, I feel like had the film kind of not taken that approach, it would not have been as memorable. It wouldn't have been as hard hitting and as impactful. And I feel like, uh, and as you guys were getting ready to hear in Buterum, from a mental health aspect, I feel like this film, this film shows the, the dangers of not only running from your fears, but like embracing them in a less than healthy uh, execution and I feel like this film is a is a terrific warning sign of what could happen have you it had you not dealt with it in a proper manner yeah absolutely uh it's definitely a warning tale uh and it the, it deals with the main character's trauma from his childhood and how he's like as an adult he's handling it and it's not the most healthy way <laughs> no no not 100 percent. and uh this film as of right now is currently trying to find a distributor so as uh much, much like spirit animal i forgot to say that uh spirit animal is is i believe you can only buy directly from them right now yeah and the uh for this one in particular, Kill Giggles, they are currently trying to find a distributor. So it, it sounds like one is coming yes. soon. He, he, he Buterin made it sound like he knew something he wasn't allowed to say yet. Yeah. So stay stay tuned for that. This is this one's definitely worth checking out. Yeah. So make sure that you guys follow us and follow um, uh, Mad One Films I, in um, for for updates on that one. And uh, let's go to our Rorschach rating scale. What would you give Kill Giggles zero to five? I would give this a three and a half. I'm going to go four. I feel like this film, it, it takes itself seriously. There are some moments of camp, but for the majority of it, I mean, compelling characters, it's well paced, it, it gets creative, and it, it's just, it doesn't hold anything back. And I, I feel like it's boldness, it takes a lot of chances that really work. Yeah, absolutely, completely agree. So, um, all right, so we're going to, now you guys are going to uh, get to hear, we sat down with Jason Butanen, who is the writer-director on Kill Giggles, and we'll be back in a few minutes. We here at Victims and Villains support independent artist and independent film, and obviously we do it for horror movies because we spun off in a whole nother podcast to do it. And I'm sitting now with uh, Jason Buterin. Buterin, sorry, had a brain fart there for a second. Uh, he is the director behind the horror film Kill Giggles. Yes, writer, writer and director, uh, tag team effort. But yes, um, uh, thriller, horror, uh, clown killing epic soon to be released by a big studio in Hollywood that we're not legally able to say yet, yet, but soon. It'll be on, uh, on screens and in hands. All right, so we haven't seen the film as of this interview. Excellent. We're going to watch it tonight. 
our review. We'll spoiler free, then. We'll keep it spoiler free. Yes, yes. Our review will be uh, a, a companion piece to this interview you guys are watching right now. Uh, so kind of tell the fo kind folks at home what the movie's about. Uh, effectively, I, I have a crippling case of coolrophobia, which means I'm deathly afraid of clowns, um, largely because of uh, the one of the movies that a fellow next to us was in, Poltergeist. Uh, the clown, the marionette clown, clown marionette scene just uh, completely unhinged me. Um, became a horror filmmaker, and I, 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 I wanted to see a movie where people killed clowns, because the clowns, the serial killers always dressed up like clowns. The monsters were always clowns. The, the spreaders of mayhem were always clowns. I wanted to see them die. And I'm like, surely someone's had to have done that before. And I started doing a bunch of research, and me and Shirley couldn't come up with shit. Uh, nobody had done that, and it seemed like such an, an original, an easy idea. Um, so that's what we did with Kill Giggles. We have a serial killer of clowns, now one who dresses up like a clown. So you got it. We sort of flipped the script just a, just enough to be different, and I, I think it, we we made we made something kind of special. I'm very very proud of Kill Giggles. Well, now I'm really excited to kind of see this this movie. Uh, where does and it, it's it's funny how uh, art normally imitates life. To you know, you write what you know, basically. Um, and so I'm kind of guessing like, uh, how long was the journey to like actually like research like trying to find such a movie. Um, I mean, it, it, it didn't take long to do the research, the, the, the script writing process. It's a story I, I'll come up with an idea, and then like four years later, it's finally done. Um, the first version, the first draft of the script I wrote was 300 pages, and I wasn't done yet. But every time I told my DP how long it was, he peed a little because he got really scared. I'm like, it'll be an 18-hour long Ken Burns narrated documentary about the death of clowns. But that was too much to do. Um, so we, we whittled it down. It, it took a long time, but... Uh, and then shot entirely on location in North Carolina. We, we've been able to put together an amazing crew of very talented people on both sides of the camera, and a lot of people gave up hours, days, weeks, months of their life to be able to, to make this happen. And we, we made something very special. Um, we made a, a, I like it more of a thriller than a horror. Um, we kind of askew some of the more modern horror tropes. There's there's no real nudity, rampant sex, gratuity, blood gore. It's just the most gratuitous thing I, I hope is the story. Um, but we made something very, very special, very Hitchcocky in and just kind of yeah something kind of cool. So you just you just you just keep heightening this like intensity of wanting to see this movie for me. I love Hitchcock. Um, so I guess my my next question is like the character design because like you look at something like Pennywise, both uh, Tim Curry and Bill Skarsgård are so iconic, and then you also have like even like non uh, well I was gonna say John Wayne Gacy has you know a very signature uh, so what was kind of the process for like designing the look of Giggles and kind of the other clowns in the movie? Um, I, I got very lucky. We had a, I have a brilliant effects artist um, and, and wardrobe tag team combo duo, uh, Mr. Joe Harp and Ms. Soraya Davis. They're just absolutely amazing. So they did, they they helped out a lot in terms of bringing those to life. Um, Joey Rudzinski uh, is a fellow I know in Greensboro who's actually a professional clown. He was one of the, he graduated from like the Ringling Brothers Clown College, like has an official degree. I mean, ac academic knowledge of, of clowning, the history of clowning. Uh, so I brought him in as a clown consultant. Um, and then I had, we just had, uh, I, I had different visions of different clowns and stuff like that, but I, I kind of would just, I just gave little text descriptions to uh, people and just sort of let them come up with their own vision. I'm like, you know, I, I want it to be this, or I would send them a, a picture of the person that we had cast. I'm like, now make a clown out of it. You know, I, I wanted each clown to have a very different look, and it's, we got, we, we, we sort of run the gamut. We've got rodeo clowns and mall clowns, and then, yeah, there's, it, it's just, I don't want to spoil anything, but every clown has its own signature distinctive look which made me happy. It wasn't just buying a bunch of wigs and shit from like from a Halloween shop and just kind of making everything look the same. Like everyone, everyone had a lot of thought put into each and every one. Now, was there ever a time where you like saw like a design for a clown and like rejected it, or was it just like literally just free reign on these designs? Uh, my, I mean, my, minor tweaks and adjustments here and there, but again, just I, I've been insanely lucky to be able to uh, pull together a, a, an immense crowd of people that are just. Can we curse on this? I don't know. Is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that are just fucking brilliant at what they do, um, and they they like me, and they haven't told me to fuck off yet. So like, I keep working with them as much as I possibly can. No, I mean it's just. I mean, and, and a lot of times too. I mean, I'll have an idea in my head, and I'll, I'll you know, uh, Shalas, I'll give it to my DP, and and he'll what he captures on camera is far more beautiful than anything I saw in my head. So it's like, it's just sort of an idea. But I I've been lucky enough to find the people that I can trust to do what they do, and they do really well. So it's a, a very very creative and collaborative effort that sounds amazing and so you, you talked about how like the spot of mental health 
where this uh, journey of writing the script came from. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about, like, did it, did it feel like therapeutic for you to kind of, like, place the fears out there and kind of, like, face them, basically? Oh, yeah. Um, when I, a lot of it sort of started, I, uh, I have a nine and a half beautiful boy who's the most beautiful boy in the world. Um, and I figured it was a matter of time before he got invited to a birthday party and the entertainment would be like bubbles to floppy footed fucker or something. Um, and being deathly afraid of clowns, like I've got two options. You know, we can either have a very well rehearsed story about where Jack's daddy disappeared to, when the truth of the matter is I'm locked in the trunk of the car crying hysterically, or I can get over this crippling case of cooler phobia. So what Kill Giggles is, is an ill advised, self administered dose of psychotherapy. Um, I wanted to kill clowns, but I like going home and spending time with my son, so it's like I figured I'd do it in a movie and then not have to to go to jail so it's kind of like cinematic catharsis or uh, sodomy you know what I mean it, there's, and, uh, I mean but then you get to the deliverable stage of movie making and it feels like sodomy so um, stay in school kids and don't do drugs or just do good ones be selective about your drug choice um, but yeah, I mean, it just, it, 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 that's what I love about filmmaking, about mu making music, writing, anything like that. I mean, it, it's catharsis. It, I have so many demons in my head screaming at the same time. Like, it's just nice to be able to get that out and just to be able to watch clowns die in wonderful ways. And I've got composition books. Like, when I get committed again for hope for the last time, um, they, it's just like, I, we've got, like, defense exhibits A through, I don't know, like, APQ or something like that. I have a lot of composition books full of clown deaths, so... Um, it, it should uh, help expedite the commitment hearings, I guess. Fair enough. All right. So my, my last question is like, how important would you say that like finding a because for you like this this project was like like you said like it's cathartic, it's therapeutic. Like, how important would you say that like uh, like finding an outlet like that is for one's mental health? I mean, you, you have to even before the apocalypse hit, and everyone got shut inside themselves and were left with only themselves. I mean, you. For me, I, I, I have to have that. Um, if I didn't have writing and, and making movies and making music and everything else like that, um, I, I would, I'm thoroughly convinced I would not be around right now. Um, and, and to be able to have the people in my life um, who support that unconditionally um, has saved my life multiple, multiple times. But a lot of times, you, you get bogged down by the demon screaming in your own head and you don't know where these thoughts come from and you don't know why you're having these thoughts and you don't know what you feel like a freak because you don't think anyone else in the whole world is having these thoughts. They are. They just don't know how to deal with it. Um, or they don't know how to vocalize it or they're too scared to say anything. Um, and so to be able to have a, a creative outlet to do all these grotesque and gory and scary things and to realize that it's just, it's a cerebral exercise and you, you can get out these thoughts and these feelings and these angers and these issues in a creative way that ultimately brings people joy. Um, you know, to uh, the, the screen is not a kill giggles. I mean, people are going to laugh. I mean, it, 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 it was a very a vivisectional point in our lives to be able to, to make this movie. Um, we, we sacrificed a lot, but we made something that makes people happy. Um, and, and, to me, and we've got, you know, we've got something that's just, um, it, it, it's a cinematic spell of movie magic at its finest. And I'm, I'm, I will never be as proud of anything else as I am of that future film. All right. So you, you mentioned, and this is the last question. I swear. Yeah. You always ask yeah, one you, more. One you, more. You mentioned uh, specifically about like you guys getting ready to like be released through a, through a uh, bigger Hollywood studio. But until that happens, where can people find uh, more information online about the movie and follow the release date updates? Um, we've got everything. We're all over the social media. Everything is um, Mad Ones Films is the name of the film company. So, I mean, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, slash Mad Ones Films. I think Instagram is The Mad Ones Films because I forgot the fucking password and they wouldn't let me in. So I'm like, it's The Mad One. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, killgiggles.com, madonesfilms.com, uh, clownkiller666 is our CB handle because I think that's going to be the next big wave of social social networking is we're going to bring back CB radios. Um, yeah, I mean, you can find us anywhere. Usually just to the left in the middle of nowhere. Where well, you guys can find uh, more information about Kill, Gil, Gil, Kill Giggles <laughs> in the descriptions below wherever you guys are currently watching this. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for your time, man. No, thank, thanks for letting me be a part of it, dude. It's an honor. All right. Have a good one, guys. All right, we are back, and uh, I guess this might be one of the oh, this might be one of the roughest ones we have uh, bared through, and that is Bigfoot's Path of the Beast. This tells the story of a husband that 
his wife magically disappears, and in a quest to find her, he turns to alcoholism and a quest to find Bigfoot, who he holds responsible for his wife's disappearance. Yes. Um, before we get too into this, I need, we need to talk about the technical issues that affected this film. I almost walked out five minutes into this. Uh, something went wrong with the version of this film that they were showing. And I talked to the director about this afterwards. We don't have an interview with him, uh, but I was able to find a minute to talk to him about this. Cause I, I wanted to make sure this wasn't a directing choice cause I didn't think it was, but the theater that we saw this in the, um, the file that they were playing it off of, I guess it was the Blu-ray, uh, the bit frame, the, the frame rate was off the, the, the bit rate was di- like really choppy and it affected the color grading in every single scene. And it, it made me seasick uh, just watching how choppy some of the scenes were. And it, like, it made me physically ill to watch this movie. And I talked to him afterwards, I guess, whatever it was, the Blu-ray that they, they had in the theater, the Blu-rays that they were selling didn't have a good print of the film. And so that really took me out of this film to the point where I didn't enjoy it at all. Like I don't have much, I, I, I it really affected how I, I saw this film. Um, I don't think it affected you as much. Did you notice any of this oh, stuff? Oh, 100%. And I'm not a technical guy in this, this slightest bit. Like there are some times where like I'll watch a movie and be like, Oh, I, I really appreciate like how they did here. Like to bring it back to to uh, Spirit Animal. Like I really enjoyed the technical, practical aspects that they were able to bring to that. I thought mm-hmm. that they did a really good job with that. Also, uh, Kill Giggles does, does a really good great job of that. For for this technical aspect, like you're right. Like the there are noticeable scenes where like color dis, uh, saturation is just way off and. There's one scene in in particular early in the film after, uh, so the film opens up on this like really just wooden breakup uh, issues between husband and wife. I mean the acting was just atrocious here, um, and then it fast forwards three years to this like Bigfoot uh, like finder or like Sasquatch hunters scene in particular where it's like these like TV people that are trying to like train other people. It, yeah, it felt like a ghost hunters type scene yeah, about that, Bigfoot. That scene in particular made me nauseous because it, it just it shifted around so much and it was so shaky. Yeah, yeah so and I was confused by that too. So you have the opening and I talked to the director a little bit about this too. So you had the opening scene where they shot it with the cameras that they were using for the film. Then you have the the opening credit montage which they shot on an iPhone 11. Which I was like, I had a feeling part of this was shot on an iPhone, uh, and then you shoot, you switch to the the t- the show within the movie, and you have the camera guys like zipping. And p- it felt like Parks and Recreation, but done very poorly. Like it felt like that mockumentary style, and I was like, is this what the film's gonna be? Because it was so jarring. There were, and there was it wasn't really made clear that you were on set for this show and the color saturation in that was so different from everything that you saw beforehand and then when it switches back to the the film you can see that difference but it what it it's jarring there because it's supposed to be but the introduction from that into that right from the opening credits was confusing like i was very confused by the change of style uh i could have used a little bit more of an opening montage if we're going to go into this tv show for a moment like, just something to make it a little bit more clear what was going on. Oh, I mean, that's not the only thing that's, like, uh, confusing in this thing. Mm-hmm. Is that there are, like, legitimately parts, specifically, like, in the second and third act, where, like, characters, like, disappear. And then it's, like, one line that explains, like, why they disappeared. But then, like, the deeper, the closer you get to the ending, it's character motivations change. And it's it's just baffling because like there were specifically times where and I want to to listeners to know this I would never kind of like get involved when it's like like 
if I'm getting into a movie, like I'm not being like, oh yeah, like, you know, you shouldn't have done this or something along those lines. But like, I was getting like very much into this movie where like the majority of my notes were, why did this character do this? This contradicts the character motivation that they originally had. And like, you're just supposed to go with it. Nothing's really explained. Yeah. The, the biggest issue I had was the, there are a lot of pacing issues to the point where it kind of gets hard to follow. Uh, there's a lot of running in the woods and it's like hard to keep track of like where you are geographically from where you were two seconds ago. Uh, there's a moment where he falls in the woods and then is running through the woods again. He falls in a field, he's running through the woods again, and then he wakes up in the same field. I was like, okay, so is everything that we just saw him running, was that all a dream? It was kind of hard to, to like, I kind of thought it was going that way where he imagines some of this in his head. But no, it, it all was supposed to have happened. It was kind of hard to just follow that way. But then there was even a moment where you stepped out of the theater for a moment, I'm assuming to like go get a drink or something. And you came back and you asked what you missed. And I told you after the fact, I told you in the theater, you didn't miss anything. What you missed was the whole time you were gone was just this long shot of this detective's or private hallway. investigator's yeah. hallway. And it's, it's such a long shot of nothing for no reason and it 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 was baffling to me like it's a lot of it's just dead space there and i i don't know what the purpose of that was um it was just a that 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 scene in particular was probably the most jarring pacing wise because it was just a lot of, you could hear him off in the distance but you weren't really seeing anything you're just looking at this blank wall and there were things on the table that you can't really read that well there's like a final notice for bills or something but it's just that's the that's the like the pacing in that was just what really distracted me and i, I wish i wish this film was tighter i feel like if it was just a little bit tighter it would have worked so much better for me than it did this movie there are tons of shots and yes like i i did miss that because i had to use i stepped out for the bathroom but there are a couple of shots later on that like are just of nothing. And there's like specifically like one in the end where I'm just like, what, why are we just staring at this? Like, like, why is this here? And there's these like long negated shots that just make absolutely no sense. And I feel like probably what's most offensive about this movie is the fact that it's dealing with such heavy topics like grief, like alcoholism, suicide. And it, it just, it doesn't take them seriously the way that I want them to. Or if it does, it lacks the emotion to take it seriously. It, it tries to take it seriously. And like it, the, what was drawing for me, like I, I, I can appreciate what they were doing with their establishing their relationship in the beginning. Cause you can tell that she's distant and he's trying, he's really trying to like bring that spark back to the relationship, but she's not there. She doesn't want to be there. She, she ends everything with him in the woods. But then later on in the film, he sees a, an idealized version of her where she's like still in love with him. And like, it's not a version that we ever got to see. And like it, it, you get to see what he's remembering or imagining. Yeah. And it, I wish that would they had either established that he was still seeing that more, or that, or like flashes back to that version of her. Um. And, uh, but yeah, there's a and then there's an entire subplot with a private investigator that is hired to track our main protagonist, John, to find out what he's been doing. But, like, they they give you, like, multiple different scenes of, like, his backstory that literally bring nothing to the character. It brings yeah. nothing at all to this story. And that, to me, I feel like was one of the more jarring narrative decisions was to give this guy so much 
space. Like I could have just had like one scene being like, oh yeah, like he was a disgraced cop that you know, is now a private investigator to make a living for himself. Yeah, that that was confusing to me. The the I think the most confusing thing was, and uh, for anyone listening out there, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make this pretty uh, easy for you to picture. The main guy, the guy whose wife's missing, looks like Bucky Barnes in The Winter Soldier to the point where I I turned to you at one point when he's running through the woods and just like, who the hell is Bucky? Uh, that's what he looks like: long dark hair with a beard. Um, they introduce his brother-in-law but before they do that they have his son answer the door for the private detective and the actor they had play the brother-in-law looks so much like the main character i was like wait so you're saying his wife is missing and they had a son like i would and i think part of it was the the change in color and lighting and whatever the color, whatever was going on with this transfer, I couldn't tell that was a different actor. Yeah, same. I thought they introduced this son that this couple had. Like, I thought he was bringing in the private investigator to help find the, the wife. It was so jarring to me that I was like, okay, so this is a different guy. Okay. It took me a little bit to catch up to that. Yeah, and that's a scene too. Like, there's that's a great example of a scene that this film has multiple scenes of that, like, just add nothing to the story. Yeah. Like, I feel like there's a lot. Like, the only other person that I would say of character value in this is Kai. And Kai is a Bigfoot hunter and gives us a ton of uh, exposition that really brings into light, like, who like John is and kind of like the, the quest for like Bigfoot and kind of like how this film's universe like views Bigfoot and stuff like that. And I feel like some of those aspects were, were done really well, but it's like, it's like trying to pick out a water droplet from a puddle. Like it's, there's nothing redeeming in this film. Yeah. Like I, 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 I wish the my, my my biggest wish for the film is I, I think that there is a good story here with a, a good idea of a, a guy who who thinks his who, whose wife disappeared and he blames Bigfoot. I like that idea. The the where the film really loses me is the private investigator stuff. If that had all been tighter, um, or if his sister had been the one to hire him because you already met her in an earlier scene and she doesn't come back at all. Like, instead of bringing in this brother-in-law and getting me confused with like the son, like I, I, I wish that B plot was just tighter. Cause I don't need to know about the cops, him being a cop in his previous career and now being a de- private detective because of some racial stuff that he did. And like, it, it was just too much backstory for not enough payoff. Yeah, 100% agree. So let's put this through our rush I've rating scale. Zero to five, where does Bigfoot land for you? Uh, given the caveat of how distracting all of the technical issues I had with this film, I'm going to have to give it a, a two. Okay. Because I, I, I can see what they were going for, and I, in different circumstances, I... Tighter edit, editing, I, I can see what they were trying to do. I just think it, it's a, it's a bit of a mess. So I'm, I'm going to. All right, so I'm going to go, way more harsh than that. Okay. Uh, because even the the technical issues aside, like technical issues, I can forgive and I can overlook, because it was just the print that the theater had. I, I can forgive that. But what I can't forgive is just the. Terrible acting, terrible writing, uh, terror like contradictory character decisions, and just a whole lot of B plot for literally no payoff. This movie for me is is not only am I going to to mark this a zero out of five. I am dubbing this in twenty twenty one the worst movie I've seen this year. Oh wow! Yeah, like I I have held that off as pretty pretty regards as a poser from our coverage of unnamed film festival back in March, Bigfoot takes the cake. 
there was a point yesterday where I would have agreed with you on that worst that I've seen of the year, but um, there. There are some atrocities that other films did at this festival that we're going to get into later that I think are a lot more unforgivable than some of the things that we saw in this. That's fine. So uh, you guys can stream right now. Bigfoot's Path of the Beast is now streaming for free with ads on Tubi. And up next, uh, we each got to see a film that neither one of us, uh, we just watched individually. And Alan is up first with re reelected. Yeah, so I got to the festival before Josh because I'm a little bit more local to Gettysburg. Uh, so I was able to make it for the first screening that they had on Friday night for a film called Reelected. It is a horror film comedy, a horror comedy film by Max Radbill. Uh, I'm just going to read you the the description here on IMDb. Deep in the woods on the 4th of July, siblings Nate and Angela must face off against the zombies of American presidents and their worst nightmares, spending the entire evening together. So it's a story about this group of friends who go out to this cabin in the woods for the 4th of July and accidentally raise the 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 spirits of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Thomas Jefferson. No, not Thomas Jefferson. Andrew Jackson. As you do. Yeah, as you do. Um, so they have zombie presidents attacking them. Uh, this film, uh, I've got some notes here. It, it has some weird editing choices, uh, but I think they're they're very, very much going for a comedic tone to this. Um, about a half hour into the film, uh, when they realize that there's all these presidential zombies, they're like, they're the undead. They, they, they've been raised from the dead. And the one guy, like, like the one who's like all about America, he's just like, no, they've been reelected. And then the title just fills the screen and it just freezes for like five seconds as like a joke. And I was like, okay, like, I appreciate that. Then they did it again later and it, there's a lot of like fun moments in this, like uh, zombie Abe Lincoln's catchphrase is four score. And he's like chasing them going four score. So it's a lot of fun like that. Um, like they're like, we're going to go take out these presidents. So the one guy like Cox a shotgun is like time for the impeachment proceedings. Like it, jokes like that. And it, it's, it's very fun. The relationship between the brother and sister um, seems a little bit forced in spots. Like, um, and some of the some of the gags go on for too long. Like some of the kills. Uh, the one character is just a str- like. It's not just the brother and sister. They have their friends and like their boyfriends, and girlfriends with them. <coughs> but. Some of the gags just go on for too long. The effects with the uh, with the presidents are a little campy, but I think that's the style that the film is going for. I think you can tell. I think the film knows exactly what it is and what it's trying to do and does it very well. Um, but there are just some moments where it it um, it just feels. It, it, it hits the mark. It hits the mark in spots, but other other points, it just misses it. Like it does a. There's a great. Se- there's a sequence in the middle of the film when everything's about to start with the zombies, where they're cutting back and forth between the three groups of people, and it's like transitioning from one sentence and the neck. The, like the next group's picking up the sentence where it ended, and it it works in spots when they do that, but other ones it just feels really forced and awkward. Uh, but the most awkward thing is at the very end, like you have the, the survive, the survivors of the zombie attack at the end. And then you have the EMTs come up with like a clipboard and say, yeah, so the ride to the hospital is going to cost you this many thousands of dollars. And it makes like this really weird statement about the medical system in America, which felt really out of place. 
And I'm like, I don't think the EMTs would be telling you how much your your ambulance trip's going to cost. Like, I don't think that's their department. I think their job is to make sure that you get the care that you need. And it just felt really out of place. Um, and it went on for, that scene went on for too long. But other than that, I really enjoyed this. This was the first time I've been back to the theater in over a year. So I had like my big bucket of popcorn, my big drink. And um, I was all all in for it, and um, it it's just, I think I think you should check it out if you get the chance, Josh. Uh, it's very it's very fun with the Americana stuff. Uh, it's not like super political. It's more of like a if you have a fifth grade knowledge of just American history, I think you'd appreciate it. It doesn't lean into left or right as much. It's more about just like the founding fathers and all of that. So, well, you guys can rent it right now on Amazon or Vudu. But you guys, if you have a library card, you can stream it for free on Hoopla. Uh, all right. So, I mean, it sounds like something that's definitely up my alley. Where, what would you rank this? Or I would give this a three and okay. a half. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's definitely fun to check out um, just for the zombie presidents like that's I think I, I, I saw a review where somebody was like, I don't know why they didn't just call this the undead presidents like <laughs> like that, that, that that's a little bit more clever. But uh, I, I would definitely I definitely recommend this. Sweet. All right. Well, next up, I got to check out a solo a solo film for myself, uh, which is Voorhees a Friday the 13th fan film. And if you guys have been following us for uh, any amount of time, you guys know that every Friday the 13th, we've been covering another chapter in the Jason Voorhees saga. How would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools, conventions, and other events? Well, now you can. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations. Educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression. And you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. Yeah, so Voorhees is a Friday the 13th fan film and basically tells the story of this bank robbery that kind of goes sideways and the bank robbers, in order to kind of lay off the heat from the cops, they end up actually staying in Camp Crystal Lake and ultimately coming up against Jason Voorhees. And the thing about these fan films is that they basically really have the ability to take these characters and do anything they want to do with them and really live out that ideal of fan fiction. And sometimes it's really good. Like you get some of the things like Bat Bat in the Sun and they're just these really epic stories that are being told and then sometimes you get fan films like Voorhees that has really great ideas but doesn't always execute them to the best of their ability and I think for me a large portion of what I loved about this film was its originality and kind of how it really reinvents the Friday the 13th formula where it's not just oh hey we're going to have camp counselors get killed because they're having sex and underage drinking no we are going to pose real threats against Jason Voorhees and that's really what I ended up liking about this film I think that the the back half of this film once Jason has a bigger part it's definitely a better movie but the setup to get all of these characters and all of these story arcs it takes a lot longer and traditionally when you look at a friday the 13th movie 
It's very, uh, there are a few slight hindrances and, and uh, exceptions to what I'm going to say is that these are very fast paced movies and they kind of don't really take their time to really kind of give you these characters and really build them up and kind of have arcs with them. And with the exception of Friday six, I would say that that's one of the reasons that I just probably my favorite is because it feels the most developed and just all of the kills and all of the characters really feel satisfying in that film. And this film feels like it's trying to take that approach, but doesn't quite stick the execution. And the acting and the writing is is really hit or miss. And I feel like what would have made it balance out a little bit more is it had this film been a little bit more fun. Uh, because I, I feel like because this scenario of a bank robbery gone wrong, it feels just like... Th- I don't know how to describe it. Like it, it doesn't have a, a fun atmosphere. Like even I can look at some of the the more terrible ideas that Friday the Thirteenth have given us. Whether you're talking about Jason goes to hell or even Jason goes to Manhattan, and these films, despite their flaws, they're still fun films. And I just didn't really have that same level of energy with Voorhees that I had with those other two examples. And to an extent, you know, this is something that is being written. And I feel like a large port uh, as fans, I feel like a large portion of what this film does the franchise dirty on is the fact that Jason shows up almost doesn't doesn't really show up fully on screen until almost the beginning of the third act. Like. It, to me, I found myself really kind of confused that this was called a Friday the 13th fan film, yet it didn't feel like a Friday the 13th fan film. And that was kind of uh, some of my, my biggest gripes with this film. And this film, really, with that also, too, it feels really busy at, at times to where, it, I don't know, this this film, I would compare it kind of to wrong turn three where if you guys listen to support us on patreon you guys got to hear our review of the first three wrong turn movies at the beginning of this year and the issue that we came to with that film is that much like later hellraiser movies it feels like a bank robbery that just happened to shoehorn in the wrong turn mythos and that's largely what the first half of this film feels like is it feels like set up to a bank heist movie that never quite arrives and this film has really good ideas but unfortunately it falls flat for me in a lot of ways and I can say that the most satisfying of this is once Jason Voorhees is actually unleashed the these filmmakers give the film give the fans a lot of just really satisfying uh homage to to the franchise and remind us about why we love Jason Voorhees and I think that they pay very great homage to uh the source material some of my favorite shots are of the uh Jason Voorhees or kind of those that are out running him whether whether it's the bank robbers or it is the cops or the hostage that you're getting to kind of see callbacks to Friday the 13th Part 2, and I, I really love those. Um, like I said, some of the kills in this are really awesome to get to see, but ultimately this film just kind of falls flat for me. Uh, I wish that they would have introduced or at least teased Jason a little bit earlier than we got it because it just feels like two conflicting visions. So for me, I'm going to go ahead and give Voorhees on our Rorschach rating scale a 2 out of 5. And now we're back to together movies yeah yeah that was a fascinating review of Voorhees thank you (laughs) uh so next up is the anthology film 1031 part two uh right now you guys can stream both parts one and two on uh Tubi Uh, I am going to say that I was not a huge fan of part one and uh for some of the reasons that I feel I'll, I'll address with part two but it is a five-part anthology film that is bookended by a Elvira horror hostess type called uh, Melvoira, the Queen of Screams. And what did you think of this movie? I really enjoyed segments of it. The uh, Some of them were 
a little bit off-putting to me. Um, I'm trying to look at my my notes here. I I'm realizing now that I shouldn't take notes in the dark in the theater. <laughs> Um, I, I have the uh, the titles of the segments real quick. Uh, so the first one is the Samheim uh, lit- liturgy, and this basically tells the story of a babysitter stumbling upon an ancient conspiracy. That is, I'm going to be super vague because the less you know about that one, the better it is. I real quick about that one. Um, do you want to just go through segment by segment? Yeah, we can. Okay, let's do that, because uh, that's probably going to be the easiest way for me. Sure. Um, so right away with that one, it's set in the 90s, but it took me a minute to figure that out. Really? Because Yeah, because nothing really says 90s. So once you see her in the video store shirt, I was like, oh, okay. So I, it's weird that she's in that for the like today because it, it just seems modern it didn't really nothing really screamed 90s with a decor sure. or anything but then you're like okay i guess this is set in the 90s then because there's no use of cell phones and like the phone's still on the wall and it's like okay like it took me a minute to catch up one of the biggest complaints i have about several of these segments is the title cards were too short like it was it didn't give me enough time to read them and this was one of them that's fair. I mean, I, I wrote, like, I, I'm i pretty quick with it, so, like, yeah. uh, I guess we balance each other out. I really enjoyed this one. I kind of thought that, like, it's really hard to talk about these without doing spoilers. Um, it reminded me of another horror film that I've seen a bit too much. I'm not going to say which one, um, but it... Well, I, I guess, like, let me, let, me, let me compare it to something that, like, is acceptable for for us. Yeah, uh, it reminds me the way that this f- short starts out. It reminds me of the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror episode, <laughs> where it's revealed that uh, Bart was actually a Siamese twin. Yes, and what they did with his Siamese twin, and yeah, how it progresses from that, like, just kept. I found myself constantly being like, just twists and turns. Yeah, and I loved it. Yeah, it. You could say that it uh it keeps it in the family. If you will, yeah, and it doesn't. That's uh, yeah. I think you you hit the 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 nail on, on the head there. Yeah, uh, I I enjoyed it, um, and I like I did like the twist at the end of this one. There was a little thing at the very end. I was like, okay, I, I enjoyed this segment a lot. It wasn't my favorite, but I I did enjoy this one. This is also not my favorite. It's my second favorite, and I really I think that the acting and the writing is really good here, and I feel like that constant like twists and turns angle that the deeper you get into it like, yeah i enjoyed that solidifies this as one of the I, I think i think what really distracted me from it was just the the wooden panels on the wall like the walls are just wood and it was not like stained wood it was just like plywood and it was just weird and it was just a weird setting for me because it made everything seem orange and i it was just a weird choice sure yeah uh, so next up is is Deadlift, and this basically tells the story of an Uber driver that is working on Halloween night and basically picks up a, a zombie slash a, a, like a dying vampire that's looking for a new host. I, I feel like that's kind of the best way to describe it. Yeah. This, horror-wise, this was my favorite segment. Because what, what's terrifying about this story is he doesn't – it's not like a stab, 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 you're dead. It's a – it's more of a psychological you're not in control of – like I'm taking over control of – Your will. Your will and losing control and – for me, that is just something that is a interesting idea and a lot more horrifying than somebody chasing you with a knife. Like, not like being stuck in a car with somebody who's invading your mind and trying to take you over. I think is just um, a lot more terrifying to me than um, if this vampire was chasing him through this neighborhood. 
Um, and as a as an Uber driver in a in a previous career, you have I've had some creepy passengers before, and like that's kind of your worst nightmare. Is like like I guess I, I kind of identify with the main character a bit, sure. having have that that experience. But just the idea of somebody invading your mind and trying to take you over that way was a lot more horrifying to me than anything else. And I, I feel like too from from if we can talk about like mental health for a second, like from a mental health perspective, this is definitely the this one and the last one, though I feel like this one handles mental health better. It definitely is um a lot like more like it takes it seriously. Not to say that the last one doesn't, we'll talk about it in just a few minutes, but it, it yeah. handles mental health and depression really well because because part of the reason that the uh, creature is able to try like be able to get into his head is because he's having these thoughts of suicide and leaving his like leaving his wife behind and like writing a note saying i'm sorry like like and i think it, it says a lot about willpower and the, his state of mind and how he's vulnerable in that moment. Like he, like he doesn't go, he doesn't want to go through with it, but at a certain point that option might be taken away from him because he's losing control of his own situation. Yeah. There's a, there's a line where the creature kind of goes to our protagonist and says, you know, broken is just a a mindset, which I think is such a, a profound uh, it might be a cop out from you know someone that has a mental health advocate that it's you know depression is sometimes like leaving is easier said than done because we have this stigma around it. But I feel like it it is one of those lines that is really profound, but it's also easier said than done. Yeah, where you can you know sometimes d- escaping kind of like depression and like making it to tomorrow is just a matter of literally flipping your mindset instead of saying you know oh I'm I'm depressed for xyz reasons just be like i woke up today like i'm yeah. alive kind of focus on the, the positives rather than the negatives and there's a, we could talk a lot more about this but i don't want to get into too many spoilers about this short because i really think this one is definitely worth checking out yes um I, and i i highly recommend this one uh just from the mental health uh, aspect and the psychological horror that it is like i i really enjoyed this one okay uh all right so uh, next up is Overkill, which was my favorite by far. Uh, Remind me what this one was. So this is the one where basically uh, serial killers compete for a final girl. Okay. And it, it does a really good job at kind of deconstructing a lot of the horror tropes for one, but also for two – it just has really smart, witty comedy in it. And I feel like that's kind of one of the things that uh, this is one of the films, this is the only film here that made me laugh to a point to where I was almost crying. Um, like, it, it's just, it's really funny right out the gate. This was my favorite because of the co- the comedy aspect. This one absolutely nailed both the the horror comedy aspect of it and then just the comedy aspect. Because there's a moment where you have the, uh, you can. What, what would you say the main the main and the main guy would be like a, a Jason, Jason knockoff. Yeah, Jason knockoff, and then you have this other guy, who it just is just like a creep. Yeah, to me, that, I think he was kind of supposed to be like a nod to the BTK killer. Yeah, because that's that's how I kind of took him. Was he was kind of like an accountant that was doing this for fun. Yeah, uh, like just their their exchange while the uh the final girl is dancing and like like just how they keep like the btk guy is just like arguing with him like no i was here for first and the the jason stand-in was just like not saying anything just being stoic and like and then uh a killer clown comes around the corner and like there there, there's so much there i will say this in my note like there's a note here that i have to talk about there's I, I've talked about this on my show, and I don't know if I've talked about it to you. Do you know the concept of Chekhov's gun? No. Okay. So the idea of Chekhov's gun is if you if you see a gun in a film or in a story, that's going it's going to come into play later. 
Uh, in my notes, there, there's a scene with the girl that they're watching uh, where she's like babysitting this kid and she's like in the, the parents' bedroom and she finds, she opens this drawer and finds their weed stash and a bunch of, bunch of sex toys. And then she picks up this giant, comically giant dildo. And in my notes, I just have Chekhov's dildo because I thought that, that was going to come back into play later in the in the short and it didn't. And I was like, Oh man, like why, why? I, I guess it's just there for the gag, but I was like, I was expecting that to come in. Like, like she's trying, like running from somebody and then she just like throws it comically. Um, that that's one of my notes. And the other one that I have, which I don't think we should give context for, but we both laughed at is just butt chugging. Do you guys know what butt chugging is? Which is just one of like, that's how it ends. And is the very last line that's that's used. I think the the less you know, the better it is. But yeah, uh, like this, just this. It's it's really funny. It's a great satire, um, and I would kind of compare this to Beyond the uh, Behind the Mask, the rise of Leslie uh, Leslie Leslie Vernon. If you guys have ever seen that movie, uh, that's kind of what this this one is. I feel like this is definitely the the highlight of the film. Yeah. yeah. And last we have Sister Mary, and basically a nun tries to come to grips with her both literal and figurative demons. And this is, this is an interesting one to talk about because there's next to no dialogue in this. It's basically a montage of action set to music that, for me, I think that it much this one and uh deadlift had really great color palettes but it, it couldn't captivate me the way that the other ones did i i i'm just now realizing that there really wasn't any dialogue in this um now this one was interesting to me having grown up in a catholic household um like the idea of a nun trying to step away from the church, but then like the guilt of that and like want not, not being sure what they want in life. I found very interesting. I made the joke afterwards to, to you. I was like, that was the weirdest sequel to sister act. I ever thought I'd see, uh, but no, I really enjoyed this one. It, it ties back into the first film, the first segment uh, in, in a spot. Um, which, which I thought was interesting. It's such a bizarre thing that, and and this is kind of my uh, my problem with both of these films, is that there's no cohesion to any of them. And I don't know if it, if it bothers you, but from someone that has seen a han- like a, a decent handful of like anthology films, like the ones that like one of the things that came out of uh, Grind Exploitation earlier this year was Once Upon a Nightmare. And Once Upon a Nightmare is basically a woman t- slowly tortures a man by telling him these nursery rhymes and kind of like gives them like a horror slash demonic twist to it. And that cohesion allows that film to work really well. And when we open up on Melvoira and close on her, I was kind of expecting that. And that was kind of one of my, my biggest issues with this. Um, aside from this, this last uh, short, but I think the the aspect to tie it back to uh, this first one is a really interesting choice. Yeah, it. I, I'm lo- checking to see if there's any connection, um, writer wise or anything, but it doesn't look like there is. I, I think this one's a very interesting. Um, character study that it doesn't have a lot of dialogue um and i i think if you, i think it's very much more enjoyable if you have that catholic background like i do sure like it, it adds it adds it adds a level sure and to it. i mean even being a christian like i obviously we were talking about this last night on the way home like uh, we've we talked several like in depth about like kind of like the idea of like organized religion versus like mm-hmm. what the Bible actually talks about. And like, there are some issues that like, well, among other things that I, I have with organized religion. 
and specifically like some of the way that the church kind of approaches things like sex and purity like i feel like that's really what helps this film kind of thrive yeah. but for me i just kind of felt like there was there was nothing for me to grab onto like like i can grab onto something in the themes that you're talking about but if i can't connect to the character then it just kind of goes out the window for me yeah no i i, I can see that as well um so, on our Rorschach rating scale, what would you give 1031 Part 2? I, I, overall, I, would, I think I'm going to give it a 4. There's a lot in here that I enjoyed. Um, and I think it, there, there's enough here that even if you can find it online and just fast forward through some of the segments that we were light on or not as, as into, like, I think there's enough here that you can enjoy, enjoy it. Um, uh, Deadlift and uh, Overkill, Overkill, really stole this for me. Like they're they're the highlight of this one. So because I enjoyed those so much, they, it gets the higher rating from me. Overkill is is definitely my favorite segment of this. Um, I did really like aspects of Deadlift, and I think that um, even the the opening one of the uh, Samheim uh, liturgy is also a really good one. Uh, but for me, I'm going to go ahead and give this a three out of five. I, I enjoyed it. Um, but anthologies are really hard for me to grade. Yeah. Um, so, but I, and we, we to- completely missed the hatchet hatchet massacre too, but I, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm, that's, it's only like, a, it's like a minute long. Yeah. Was there, was my, my, I guess I wanted to ask, was it the hatchet massacre one in the first part? No. No? Okay. So I, <laughs> I, I, I have was. like no idea. I thought that's I thought that's why I was confused, but okay. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it's literally like it's like a minute and a half. It, yeah, and it's like awkward that you see something like that in a. I guess this was a 2019 film. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little bit uh, offensive yeah, in spots. Yeah. yeah. Not not as offensive as some other things that we saw, but we're about to get into that. So yeah, so let's get into this last one. This is a uh, bloody summer camp, and this is basically the story of camp counselors as they are preparing for the upcoming camp season, and slowly become getting knocked uh, knocked off one by one by a masked killer. Yeah, uh, so the festival was supposed to show the director's cut, but you said you saw online that that, that changed? Yeah, so they, they updated it. Uh, Creature Feature updated this on the weekend. Uh, the, it was either a couple of days before saying that they were just going to show the standard version. So as of this recording, I this is not streaming anywhere. I don't know as of right now where you guys can watch this from as of this recording. Uh, however, I don't know which version. I guess we should preface that yeah. by saying we don't know if we watched the original cut or the director's cut. Yeah, because looking online, there's no time length for us to compare it to because uh, the version that we saw was two hours and probably at least 45 minutes too long. Oh, without a doubt. Uh, this is the final film of the night. It started at 10. We were leaving the theater about 10 after 12 because like the other like the other films that we saw yesterday, it had some technical issues at the beginning. Uh, it was just plain static. And I think you posted some of it on social media. Yeah, it's on, it's on, it was on our Instagram story. So if you guys saw that and kind of been like, what am I watching? Yeah, that's what it was. I was like, it, and it was it was fun because everyone in the theater was like, "Oh man, this sucks," and we were all having like a like a joke at it, and it was a fun moment. So, um, but it, so it got a late start, but it was still two hours long by the time we by the time it was actually said and done. Yeah, and so if you guys really listened recently to our sister show, uh, abyss gazing, a horror podcast that Mark and I host, we just put out a episode on sleepaway camp. And as I mentioned previously, when we were talking about giggles 
is that stars uh, Felissa Rose. And Felissa Rose is also in this movie. This movie, I, as I put it on Letterboxd, this is the director's cut of Sleepaway Camp that nobody asked for. This movie is almost a beat-for-beat remake of that movie with less interesting characters and no groundbreaking nature to it. I I can't really come from the Sepoy Camp aspect of it. I will say there there's maybe one likable character in this and that's the uh the main girl Tiffany. Um this is pr- from the filmmaking aspect, this is probably the most well shot film that we saw at uh, Creature Feature Weekend. Uh, I would still argue that Giggles has better shot than this. Giggles probably has better cinematography, but of the Cabin in the Woods type films sure. that we saw this weekend, this is the best shot. Uh, it was very solid color wise, uh, sound wise, it was very well done. Um, with the exception of a few spots, like when they're driving in a car, you could tell the audio was very much dubbed there. Yeah. Um, story-wise, I saw the twist ending coming. We both did. At the very beginning of the film. Yeah. Um, and that, that kind of took me out of it. And then it's a, so it's a two-hour film. It feels like an hour and a half of a setup. And then it's trying to catch up for the last half hour. Like, oh yeah, we're supposed to be a. The film's called Bloody Summer Camp. We need some blood in here. So the first, the first kill doesn't actually happen until almost halfway into the film. Yeah. And I want to preface that by just saying that, like, just because this is a slasher movie and there's not that many, there's not that much blood or gore or kills. Doesn't necess- it, that's not what makes it a bad movie. You look at something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Halloween, and there is such a low body count for both of those films compared to today's standards. That is not what makes it a, a terrible film, is that this film is filled with dead air. Like, the first, like, half hour, 40 minutes, like... I really was having fun with this because there's a lot of there's a lot of humor in this, you know, um, that they that they do do really well. And by the time you hit that 45 minute mark, you're like, all right, like, what are we actually doing here? Like, like, what is the purpose of this movie that we're investing ourselves into? Yeah, and like I said, like, there's only one character that I is at all likable. Uh, and it, I guess the two main girls that we're introduced to are both likable. I would even say that there is only one developed character that doesn't feel one note, and that's the same exact one you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, everyone else just seems like – it feels like they're – especially with the, the one uh, director's haircut, it feels like they're just doing oh, a – terrible a take, wigs in this, by the yeah, way. Yeah, they're doing a take on Wet Hot American Summer. And it it just falls flat, and then you have the 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 sheriff played by Dave Sheridan from uh, Scary Movie and Bubble Boy, The Devil's Rejects, Ghost World. Uh, I guess he played Doofy in Scary Movie, um, but I absolutely hated every scene with the sheriff. He was so distracting. There was one segment where he's just ripping on all of the counselors at the camp after somebody goes missing and just making all these different eighties references, which I, I I'm a big pop culture guy. I got the references. They just weren't funny. The only funny one was when he called the, the two main girls, uh, Tootie and Blair and then called the redhead, Mrs. Garrett. Like that was the only one that was remotely funny to me, and that was the only time anything that he said in this film made me laugh. Uh, there's a there's a joke in here that for a oh, it's an entire segment. It's a whole segment in here that I am surprised any film in 2021 has in place for jokes. And I think the biggest problem I have with this movie is. 
there are jokes in here that are blatantly racist and just not funny. Mm-hmm. And it's not just a segment we're going to talk about in the sec in the second. At the beginning of the film, when the two main girls stop for drinks, the the white girl picks out a Coke and a grape soda for her African American friend. I'm like, really? Like that just made me roll my eyes. Uh, and I I can I can forgive that kind of stereotype. What I what I can't forgive is what they do with the sheriff. And I think before that, there's a good moment where the African American chef cook at the camp sees the killer. He's like, Nope, don't want any part of this and just leaves. And I like that joke. That's I can appreciate that. What I, what I cannot tolerate in 2021 is the cops like jumping the African American character and just racially profiling him and like planting evidence on him as a joke because it's not funny it, it's not and like just just for like some context there's a white guy that comes through like full of blood and sweat and has a knife on him and they're like oh no you know he's just he's he's whatever you know boys away boys kind of thing and yeah. then they juxtapose that to the scene you're talking about yeah and it Call me woke if you want to, but I just don't think it's funny. No. Like, there, there, there's so many tragedies that we've heard about over the last several years. And, and so many that, that don't even hit the social medias or get the viral nature that, you know, what we've seen in the last few years have gotten. Yeah, and it... I just... It, it, it's very disappointing to see something like this it nowadays like it's disappointing to see it at all but especially in something that is so recent they it 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 really took me out of it and really soured the whole experience for me i 100 percent agree especially when you look at like the catalog of episodes that we've put out in the last year and kind of like how we as not only a podcast but as a nonprofit have made a stance against racism and prejudice, period. It is hard to watch scenes like this. It's extremely uncomfortable. And, you know, if that's you, like, you know, I would recommend checking out our our Black Lives Matter series that we did last year and Celebration of Diversity that we've done this year. Um, Also, our Watchmen series that we did last year um, and, and see maybe if, you know, that doesn't, you know, change... Fingers crossed, it does you know kind of change your viewpoint on jokes like this, especially in our modern culture. I think that the only thing that this film does really well is it it does have some great gags and great kills in this, but they are so far and few between. And like you said, like the first like hour and a half of this is set up where you just have a lot of dead space. And then, like, the last half hour, they're like, oh, yeah, we're supposed to be doing a slasher film. Here's all the blood and guts that you came from. Yeah, it it definitely suffers from pacing with that. Uh, if you take away the sheriff stuff, the, 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 the killer is a little bit obvious. And I think when they go into the here's how we did it montage that was a little bit too long but um yeah the sheriff stuff really just took me out of it and in the like the the quote big reveal of who the killer like actually is like when you look at something like screams a great example of of why i'm going to say this is because uh if you've seen scream you know how it kind of ends and kind of like the quote killer's motivation it it makes sense however here the the killer's motivations in this one for why he is a a slasher just literally makes zero sense it's it's pure nonsense Uh, i i don't want to get into spoilers on the show i think the in the the motivations for why he they how he does what he does make a little bit of sense if you dive into it but i don't want to do that because of spoilers but uh we'll talk after the show but yeah it, it it's even my take might be a little bit of a stretch but 
Um, yeah, like there's no backstory for him that really says why he's to this point when we when you first see him in the flashback. So I'm, I mean, even for as you know, to bring up to kind of like look in this, like even as like ridiculous of an explanation that we get in a spirit animal, that is kind of that's our prologue. Yeah. And it's something that is played and continuously developed as a B subplot throughout the course of the film and it's done really well. Yeah. And this one just does not do that well. Uh, it doesn't. So let's go ahead and let's put this through the Rorschach rating scale. Final film. You go first this time because I, I'm going to give this a one and a half. I, I think that this film is filled with dead air uh, jokes that just do not land and just super awkward pacing that uh, and underdeveloped characters as well. I, I'm going to go even lower. I, I think I'm going to give it half a star. Okay. Like I, there, there's enough, there's stuff there that is enjoyable, but I, I can't condone what, what like, like some of the jokes in this, like, I just can't, I, I, I just can't like, yeah, that, that that's what it's gonna be. Half a star for me. It it drags, yeah. So you're uh you're you're fine, dude. Um so you <laughs> guys can uh, uh if you guys have seen any of these movies, we recommend checking them out. Make sure that you guys are following us on uh YouTube, Instagram, really all the socials like Helen said at the beginning and, and kind of check out uh our coverage of Creature Feature Weekend because we still have a, a lot more great stuff for you guys coming out in the coming weeks. Uh, where can people find you have to watch this podcast? Uh, you can find you have to watch this podcast on all major podcasting platforms. We also live stream weekly on our Twitch channel and our Facebook page. Uh, we go live with our episodes Tuesday nights, usually at six o'clock Eastern. Um, but we do other stuff on Twitch throughout the week. So go ahead and follow us there. Um, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. All right. Well, you guys can find me. I am uh, I'm on TikTok at Gent Ghostface, and uh, then you guys can also follow me on Letterbox and at Captain Nostalgia. And you guys can follow us everywhere at Victims and Villains. If you go to victimsandvillains.net, you guys can get access to all of our social media, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch. And YouTube, and you guys can also uh, find movie reviews, more podcasts like this, and most importantly, our mental health resource library. Yeah, go go check out Victims and Villains on Twitch because Josh and I were talking about it last night. We got some exciting things coming down the pipeline. So super exciting. So yeah. Until next time, friends. The movie is ended. Stay spooky.